Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning. If you were not sure what that baptism was, uh, on Friday we had a beach worship uh, followed by baptism when we had four come uh, forward with Believer's Baptism that we baptized on Friday. It was a phenomenal time of just fellowship, gathering one another, and then we had a bonfire at the end and the kids were all having fun, s'mores. Uh, it was a great, great time. Uh, we're going to have more of those in the future, so we would love for you to join us. But we're going to be uh, jumping into the text here. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. We're looking at verses 22 through 33. Uh, and I labeled this as a, the sermon as kind of a statement or as a question, if you will, is was Jesus God or was Jesus just a great teacher? Uh, this is extremely crucial and important for us as believers to know, not just know, but to believe and not just to believe, but to understand and then also articulate this to others if they ask us, what do you believe and why you believe it? If we don't know and believe, first off, that Jesus is in fact God's son and that Jesus is also God, we've got a lot of things that we've got to unpack additionally into this because the whole basis of Christianity that we have our hope on is the, sacrifice, the sacrificial system and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So let's look at our text today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 33. I'll have the slides up on the screen, so follow along with me if you will. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of lawless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord continually before me, because he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not forsake my soul to Hades, nor give your Holy One over to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Men, brothers, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of the fruit of his body on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither forsaken to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you both see and hear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. As we open up your word, God, please give us ears to hear, illuminate the text, speak to us through your word. We thank you for this time we can gather corporately together, unified through your scripture and through the sacrifice that your son has done for us. Be with us at this time. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. So by way of introduction, I want to bring an item of importance that kind of is derived out of my sermon title, but is also a statistical study that has recently been conducted by Ligonier Ministries in conjunction with Life Worry Research. So every two years, Ligonier Ministries puts out a survey, and it's called the State of Theology. Now, as they put out this survey, they ask statements, or they make these statements, and then they ask people to respond, and they put these into two different categories. They have U.S. adults, and then they have U.S. evangelicals. One of the statements that really just stood out to me that is a tremendous issue that we're going to see that Peter addresses in this text through his sermon that he gives in the first century is this statement here. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. This was the statement. And then they ask people to respond in one of two ways. Either agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And look at those numbers. U.S. adults state that 53% of them strongly agree with this statement. Okay? Look how close the U.S. evangelical number is to this statement as well. This is U.S. evangelicals stating that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Do you see any issues with that? Do you see any problems with that? Tremendous issues and tremendous problems. And so 
By way of introduction, I wanted to kind of lay the foundations here because what Peter is addressing to the Jews in Jerusalem during the time of Pentecost in his sermon is no different than what we as Christians today face on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis on defending the deity of Christ and the work and atonement that he has done on the cross for our sins. So if we look at this and we understand what Peter is talking about, last week we talked about the introduction or one of the introductions into his sermon where he's introducing the passage about Joel and then he moves us on. The introduction to Joel is powerful and you could have just ended it there, but he continues on. Now remember, as Peter is speaking, he is basically declaring Old Testament prophecies that are being fulfilled at that time. And we see a huge portion of the Joel prophecies being fulfilled at that time. And then Peter is also making it known that the last days, according to Joel and according to what Christ even said too, the last days was upon the resurrection, excuse me, the ascension of Christ. And then we are now in those last days until Christ returns on his second coming. And so he has made this clear, he has made this known, and he is speaking to the devout men, the devout men who had gathered at that time in Jerusalem, according to the the practices of the Feast of Weeks and of Pentecost and everything else, they had gathered and they were wondering what is happening here. And we see that there was two types or two groups of individuals, those who were participants in the work of the Holy Spirit by having the gift of languages, and then those on the outside who were mocking these individuals accusing them of being drunk at 9 a.m. And Peter addresses this, and then he doesn't skip a beat, and he immediately moves into the person and the work of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is Peter's polemic, Peter's apologetic of Jesus being the Messiah, the Messiah that all of the Jews had been waiting for since the Old Testament, and they missed out on it. And Jesus has already told the disciples, you're going to go out there and be witnesses to me. And we see Peter is about to birth the church because Jesus had said, Peter, I will build my church on you. You are going to be the catalyst in launching this to the people. And when we see this, we see that Peter's making this case. And look at verse 22. Men of Israel. So we see Peter appealing to these men. These are men of Israel. This is a term of endearment saying, men, I know that you belong to the nation of Israel. Listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, Jesus who came from Nazareth, a man attested to you by God. Well, how did God attest Jesus to man? Well, Peter answers that question. Attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. So when Peter is ending this verse 22, is just as you yourselves know, he is understanding and he knows his audience. He knows his audience are devout men, men that would have come back to Jerusalem at that time to participate in the Feast of Weeks in Pentecost who were only there because they were following the Old Testament tradition. They were following this tradition and he's saying to them, you know what was prophesied about the Messiah. And what was prophesied of the Messiah? What were these Jews thinking in their mind as they were hearing these words of Peter? Well, the first thing they would be thinking of in Isaiah chapter 35, verses five through six, and this is in direct correlation with what Peter is saying about miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him. Look at Isaiah chapter 35, verses five through six. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and the streams of Rabbah. Now, when you look at this, we see Old Testament prophecy concerning the Messiah, concerning the yet to come about what miraculous signs and wonders will be done. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, did Jesus open the eyes of the blind? Did Jesus heal the sick, cure the lame? Did he do any of that? The answer is yes. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verses four through five. And this is Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Is that not right there what Jesus is doing, a fulfillment of that prophecy we see in Isaiah? It absolutely is. Jesus is authenticating himself. Now also we see in Luke chapter seven, verse 20 through 22. When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come? So these individuals are asking, are you the Messiah? 
Is it you? And these were men that were trained under John the Baptist asking, Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one we've been waiting for? Are you the one that the Old Testament has been telling us to be on the lookout for? Are you the one who is to come or should we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits and he granted sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to him. Again, is this not also another fulfillment and another instance and case in which Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy written in Isaiah chapter 35? What's interesting though is that even these individuals under the teaching and training of John the Baptist still failed to recognize that this was in fact Jesus the Messiah because they had assumed that the Messiah was going to be riding in on this triumphant horse, obliterating the Romans and then establishing his kingdom physically on earth. But that is not what Jesus came to do. He established his spiritual kingdom. He did not come to establish a physical kingdom. Now here's what I also wanna point out on that is happening in our day in the earlier portion of Acts 2 with the portion that is prophetic fulfillment of Joel's prophecy is that the focus of the miracles that Jesus performed was not to point people to the miracles themselves, but to authenticate the one who performed the miracles. That's why Jesus did the miracles. Could Jesus have snapped his fingers and healed everybody of everything at that time? 100% he could have, but that was not in the plan. That is not why he did it. But what happens is people were not thinking, wait, hold on, I know what the Old Testament says, this guy's doing that. No, they were too focused on the miracles thinking, huh, not sure, let's, uh, let's adjust this again, let's approach him again. And here's the sad thing. Here's the sad reaction to those miracles that Jesus performed. Mark chapter six, verse one through six. And Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown. So this is his turf. Came into his own town and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many listeners were astonished saying, where did this man get these things and what is this wisdom given to this man as such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is this man not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were taking offense at him. And Jesus was saying to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was marveling at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. That passage right there is very scary because of the failure of these people to recognize that Jesus was in fact the Messiah because they attacked his personality and his upbringing thinking that there's no way that this is the Messiah because he was a carpenter, those are his brothers and sisters, that's not the Messiah that I had pictured in my head. That's not the Messiah I wanted to have as the Messiah. The Messiah that I want is this Messiah. That is not the Messiah. And what's interesting too is that they were fixated just like we tend to be as well on the shiny, attractive objects and completely miss out on the truth of the matter. See, in that earlier passage in Acts chapter two, so many people get focused on the gift of tongues and prophecies and visions that they just become enamored with this miraculous, but they completely fail to look at the orchestrator and author of those miracles at that time. They discount God and they look at how I can be beneficial from these miracles. They look at these miraculous, shiny objects and they think this is gonna make me be a better person, a better Christian, move up in the spiritual ladder, become some elite Christian. But yet they're missing out on the actual, true, saving grace of the Messiah. And Peter is bringing this home. He's heaping these coals on the Jews listening. He's like, look at everything that Jesus did. You all were so fixated on his miraculous gifts that you did not listen to the message that Jesus was saying. Well, Jesus, were you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? That's what John the Baptist guy said. Did Jesus come right out and say, yes, yes, in fact, I am? No, he did not. That would've been too easy. Instead, he said, I've done all these things. What do you think? Go and tell John the Baptist all the things that you have seen and heard. And so often we see in our culture and our time that we go to scripture 
to take out of scripture to benefit ourselves for my personal gain and benefit and not because this is what is commanded of me to give honor and glory and worship to the main creator and the author of our salvation, Jesus Christ. We take this and we make it about ourselves. This has turned into Christianity, especially with that statistic you saw, is more of a moralistic, therapeutic type of deism. How can I benefit from God? What can God give me to make my life better? And I want all of that. Die to self, I don't want that. Take up your cross and follow me, I don't want that. I want this, I want the shiny, attractive objects. Well, don't be scared when trials and tribulations come your way. No, you're sinning, that's why you're in trials and tribulations. No, it's because you're living a holy life set apart from the rest of the world, which makes people angry and upset because your righteous and holy living isn't pointing to yourself, it is pointing to the one who has filled you with the spirit to be able to live a life pursuing after holiness, pursuing after righteousness. And when people see your right living and the right living that Jesus had done, it accuses them of their own sin. It's like a mirror that they can't help but see. That's what holy or righteous living looks like. I'm not doing that. How dare you be so righteous and ignorant towards me? You need to be accommodating to me and welcome me for who I am. We welcome anybody in this church who wishes to hear the name of God and the name and the message of Jesus Christ proclaimed. But we will not allow you to stay living in sin as if that's okay. That is the most unloving thing we can ever do. We cannot compromise the content of the gospel to capitulate to what the culture is asking and demanding of us. I asked somebody, someone had written in to me, and if you're watching online, I'm going to answer this question right now. How does Five Bridges treat transgender individuals if they were to come into this church? We will lovingly accept you into this church to hear the word of God preached. But that sin is no different than any of the other sins that people commit. And if I have an adulterer living in this church, if I have a drunkard living in this church, a homosexual, transgender, I'm calling, I'm not calling, but Christ is calling you to repent of that sin and turn to him. So we can be accepting and welcoming of outsiders into here, but you cannot stay in that condition. You will not stay in that condition if the spirit of God has indwelt you and has changed you and has moved you from dead to life. And Peter is calling out these men in verse 22 by stating this is in fact Jesus the Nazarene. And then in verse 23, he moves over. He moves over and he is talking now what they had done. Now here's what's interesting though about all of these miraculous signs and wonders. In Acts 2, verse 41, we see that 3,000 souls at the conclusion of this message, 3,000 souls confess to Christ. But what made them confess to Christ? Did Peter perform any miraculous works during this sermon? He did nothing of the sort. All he did was exposited the text, explain the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in the personal work of Jesus Christ. But look at what happens. 3,000 souls confess to Christ not because of the miraculous works that were visible, but because of the invisible work of the Spirit in the hearts of the hearers, recognizing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That is what is the most miraculous power of transformation ever. When you see an individual who has lived, or you yourself has lived a life of habitual, horrific sin, and when God redeems you, and you can look back and say, oh my goodness, look at what God has done in my life. I had never been pursuing after Christ. I never cared about Jesus. I gave two hoots about any of that. All I cared about what I can do for my own benefit, for my own gain, and then Christ supernaturally works inside you through the power of the Holy Spirit, changes your entire disposition to abandon that and to pursue after him. And this is what Peter is calling these men to do at this sermon in this point of Acts. Because here's the main point that we have to understand about what Peter is teaching in this, what Christ is teaching in this, and what the entirety of the gospel is about. The point is about Christ. The point is not about us. It will never be about us. The point is the recognition of the work of Christ and what he accomplished once and for all. It wasn't an ongoing thing that Christ had to do. He accomplished it one time and one time only. And the only way that that could have been possible is that Jesus was God, not a great teacher. If Jesus was a great teacher, none of that would have mattered. If anything, best case scenario, he paid for his own sins for that short period of time. But we must understand that Jesus is co-equal. 
co-eternal to the Father. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. And Peter is driving this point home to them that Jesus is God who came as man, yet he still remained and possessed his full deity with what he did on the cross. Now here's the sad thing. That statistic I showed you, a 44% of US evangelicals stated that Jesus was a great teacher but he was not God. I don't like statistics like that because you cannot be an evangelical and say that Jesus was a great teacher and not God. There's no way. If you deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, you have no part of anything that he has done. You cannot deny Jesus and still consider yourself an evangelical Christian. There's no way. So that 44%, to me, what is sad, those are non-believers sitting in the pews of churches that are getting pulled with this question. And that scares me, and that should scare you to think, am I that type of individual that has heard Christ preach so much that has seen the miraculous transformation of individuals within the church, that have been a participant of everything that was happening within the church, yet I failed to connect the dots. I've rejected, I have put my own priorities before my understanding of who God is, and I'm still in the church thinking that I'm on my way to heaven when in fact I'm on my way to hell. And that's what the verse that just, God rocked me to the core was Matthew 7, verse 21, where many will say to me in those days, Lord, Lord, do we not perform miracles in your name? Did we not do this in your name? All this other stuff. So these are terms of familiarity. These are individuals that have participated. But Jesus says to them, depart from me. I never knew you. That's scary. That's what these 44% of evangelicals are stating because the second John chapter one verse seven says, because I want you to see that this isn't my opinion stating that they're not believers because that's a bold claim, Right? You don't want to hear Ethan Jago's opinion. This is what the text says. Second John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, but those who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. So someone who denies Jesus as God in human flesh is no different than the antichrist, is no different than a false teacher. And we all know what will happen eventually to the antichrist. They will die and spend eternity into hell. So here's the question that these men of Israel were probably wondering that we probably wonder too, well, hold up, Peter, you're telling me that Jesus of Nazarene, who did all these miraculous signs and wonders, he was in fact God? How, how or why would God allow Jesus to be killed if Jesus was God? Why would that happen? Why would this have happened? So look at verse 23, because this verse here, <laughs> We could spend two Sundays unpacking this verse right here. Verse 23, this man, man referring to Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. We're gonna pack that here in a second. You nailed to a cross. Granted, collectively, he said, you nailed him to a cross. The man that God had predetermined through his foreknowledge you killed and nailed him to a cross by the hands of lawless men and put him, Jesus, to death. That's why I'm saying Peter is being bold with the gospel message here. B Peter is not holding back. He's holding no punches. What I want us to look at right here is that phrase, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Because to answer that question, well, why would God allow Jesus to be killed? Well, the problem is, is that some people will assume in this passage that God sending his son to earth was reactive and not proactive. What do I mean by that? There's theological camps, and there's one that has been growing, sadly, with much momentum, is called open theism. Open theism is the view that God does not know what will happen or what creation will do in the future. He is reactive to his creatures. That means that God is a contingent being. That God is sitting in the heavens waiting, what are they gonna do next? Oh, okay, that's what's happening? All right, uh, execute plan A, B, and C. That's what they think is happening. But the, what we as Christians need to understand is that God is completely sovereign over everything that occurs and happens in this world. Everything. There's nothing that takes him by surprise. But some people say, well, hold on. You know, what, what I think is happening is that, you know, God looked down the spans of time and he saw 
okay, they're, they're gonna kill Jesus or they're gonna do this. Okay, yep, I'm gonna execute plan Jesus. Okay, plan Jesus, get in there. We're gonna use your death to save the sins of mankind. That's what they would purport. That's what they would push. That's what they would believe in is that Jesus was the, the backup option or God's holy smokes reactive plan. Let's get in there. We've got to save these people. But what is happening here that Peter is saying is that he was delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. If God is timeless, spaceless, and he is eternal and he has all knowledge, he knew that this was going to happen way before the foundations of the earth. This has always been his plan. And so what we see here, this is what we see here in, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter two, verse 12, we see the fulfillment of the covenants of promise, but specifically what we need to look at what Jesus had done through the foreknowledge and predetermined will of God, this is what is called the covenant of grace. This is the covenant of grace that we see in the Old Testament play all the way throughout the Old Testament and then into the New Testament, finding its culmination. See, here's the question, or here's the answer to that question about, well, why would God allow Jesus to get killed? See, God in his complete sovereignty uses all manner and means for his glorious purpose, allowing evil actions of mankind, despite them not knowing, to nail an innocent man to the cross for the glory of the redemption. That is why this happened. And people may think, well, Ethan, that was evil that had occurred. God allowed that to happen to Jesus for our salvation. God is completely sovereign over everything that occurs and not just completely sovereign, orchestrates things proactively to work according to his will and his plan. But a lot of times when we read this in the text, we feel offended. Well, what about my free will? I can make choices all on my own, can't I? You're free to do exactly what God wants you to do in accordance with his will. So that's your free will. The easy thing for us to do is to, again, formulate a watered-down form of the gospel of everything pointing to Christ and less of us to everything pointing to us and less of Christ. That is what has been happening in the modern evangelical world. And we have to bring it back to the proper biblical understanding of what Jesus taught, what Peter's driving home to these men, and apply it into our lives. And if you don't like what I'm saying about the predetermined or the foreknowledge of God? Look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. This is incredible. We know about Joseph being sold into slavery in Genesis chapter 37. His brothers meant something for evil. They sold him into slavery, and we all know the story. Hopefully, he, he moved his way through a lot of persecution, a lot of bad times and everything else, and eventually he became the number two. But look at how Joseph responds to his brothers at the end of his life. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, his brothers... You meant evil against me. And from an earthly perspective, what had occurred to Joseph was in fact evil. But God meant it for good in order to do what has happened on this day to keep many people alive. Apply that verse, understanding of context. See, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense with that. But we don't like to apply that to ourselves and we don't like to apply that, that Jesus came to save us, save us according to the foreknowledge and predetermined plan of God. And so this section here is so rich theologically because these Jews sitting there listening to this would be making these connections, hopefully, that a lot of what was being spoken of the old, it was finding its fulfillment in the new. Now, what we need to understand with this is that verse 23, that Jesus was delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. We have to understand that God chooses whom he chooses for his glorious purpose and will. We don't choose, God chooses. He chooses, but look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, if you don't like this. Well, Jesus shouldn't have died on the cross. That was bad. You know, if I could go back in time, I would rescue Jesus from being crucified. I would stop you. I, I've heard people say that if I could go back in time, I would want to you know, not let Jesus get crucified. That was our salvation. Why would you stop that? What would be from an earthly perspective, horrific, evil, atrocious act, and it was. Jesus experienced the full amount of that pain and torment and suffering. He experienced all of that, but went to the cross willingly. And people may say, well, that's cosmic child abuse because that's not okay, that's not okay. Okay. 
by you stating that this is God sending his son Jesus is cosmic child abuse, you're interpreting deity through a creaturely lens. God is not constituted or made up of parts. Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal. It's three in one. We have one God who is known in three distinct persons. So I can't separate the two like this and think that this is cosmic child abuse. But here's the thing about this redemption that God had enacted through his son Jesus. Isaiah 53, 10. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him. Crush him. This is a future messianic prophecy. Putting him to grief. If you would place his soul as a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of Yahweh will succeed in his hand. See, this is the continuance of the promise that God had made all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, 15. This is something that Peter was driving home to these men of Israel, saying, guys, you've got to connect these dots. How are you not picking up what was spoken of back then? And Peter can say that because he was one of them. You read all through the New Testament, you're like, Peter, you are dense, man. You are thick-headed. How are you not tracking this? Because we're looking on this view of history looking back. And he's saying this to the Jews, saying, guys, listen. Now, here's what I want us to look at real quickly. Because as we look into this passage of David, we've got to understand this uh, beautiful covenant of redemption and grace thematic element that you see throughout the text because that is where Peter's about to bring these men to. In Genesis chapter three, verse 15, this is immediately following the fall of Adam and Eve sinning. And this is God speaking to both man and Satan. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, meaning the serpent and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. He is referring to Jesus. This is Genesis. This is Genesis speaking of a messianic prophecy that won't come till thousands of years later. This is just showing you that God was not reactive in sending his son. This was always a part of the plan. Always a part of the plan. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, this is critical for us to understand because in Genesis 3.15, that is like, if you will, the, the, the introduction for us to understand everything that happens throughout the rest of the historical narrative of scripture. If we fail to understand the deep impact of sin and the implications, and we fail to see that even Genesis, that there are two types of seeds. We have the seed of a woman, right? Now, when you think of seed, think lineage, think people. And you have the seed of Satan. One party, the woman's seed, is those who follow the Lord since she is the object of the Lord's redemption in this verse. You may think, why do we always have genealogies in the Bible? Bang, right there. To show you how God sovereignly acts through all of these generations to lead to the Messiah. And this is important because this is where Peter's taking them. The other party is the serpent seed that we see in 315. This is those who choose the deceptive waves of offering wisdom apart from the divine source. So women's seed, those in the family of God. Serpent seed, those not. Very clear. There's no third party Right? You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. That's what I'm saying here. Right? We see that play all throughout the text. Now look at this where he says, men of Israel. Let me reread this verse and I want you to now track this, okay? Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst just as you yourselves know. He is talking to members and parties of the women's seed. Members and parties of God's elect. And then he says this, you nailed to the cross of handless hands of lawless men and put him to death. Those men who did that were part of the serpent seed, part of those who rejected Christ. But God, did God also not use those of that seed to bring about his redeeming plan? He did. God can use evil actions of man to still bring him glory. And then this moves us into a few different things in verse 22. The evil actions of man were in God's permissible will to occur for his purpose, his action, and for his glory. And Peter is reflecting them back, hopefully reflecting them back, thinking of the instances and occurrences in the Old Testament that many had questions on concerning the events and how this points to the Messiah. Because that's what he is bringing home in verse 22. And that's what he is bringing home in verse 23. And he gives us into three different answers for the question that he knew that they were asking of, if Jesus is the son of God, how could human beings kill him? Well, one, it was predetermined that this would happen. It was predetermined that this would happen. Two, God can do what he wills and when he wills it. 
And then three, it was according to the plan, going all the way back to Genesis 3.15. So well, how, how could man kill Jesus? God allowed it. Not only allowed it, he orchestrated it. Not only orchestrated it, it, he blessed it. This was according to the plan that God had enacted all the way in Genesis, finding its fulfillment in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now here's another verse to support my assertions here and what I'm saying. In Romans chapter nine, verse 15 through 17, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the one who wills or the one who runs, but on who? God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up in order to demonstrate my power in you and in order that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. See, this is what the center of the gospel is about. It's about Christ. It's about God. It's about his glory, not about us. We've got to stop reading ourselves into every single passage thinking, how am I gonna feel better about myself? What's gonna get my spiritual juju going for the rest of the week? It is not about us. God raises people, lets them go down. Everything that is happening in this world, God is allowing it to happen. And this is what we've got to understand. But what is interesting, if this is invoking some kind of emotional reaction against me, you wanna come up here and smack me? Hold up. One, please don't do that. But two, hold up. Because you're hearing the word of the gospel message being proclaimed accurately. I'm not throwing a scant view on this. This is the biblical understanding of what had happened and occurred with Christ. You're not arguing with me. You're arguing with something inside of you that doesn't seem right because you've probably been baked in traditionalism for the last 40, 50 years of hearing poor expository preaching. And I'm not saying that I'm the greatest expositor, not by a long shot. What I'm saying though is when you read the word of God and you allow the word of God to say what it says, that is what has the power to change your heart. That is what has the power to bring you to a deeper understanding of who God is and who are you in light of a holy and perfect God and how can you stand before a holy and perfect God? That is what's happening. That is all that I am doing is reading what the text says and explaining what the text says, pointing to other scripture to support what the text says. Because this is interesting and we've got to understand this because Romans 9, 15 through 17 isn't left in isolation. There's tons of other scriptural passages but one that the Lord has used to speak to me is from the book of Lamentations I don't often go to the book of Lamentations for my discipleship uh, Bible study time I don't but there's something about this passage that is gorgeous Lamentations chapter 3 verse 37 through 39 who is there who speaks and it happens unless the Lord has commanded it hold up you mean to tell me that even us speaking is because God is allowing us to speak. Yes, that is what I'm saying. Well, that's just absurd. He doesn't care about my speech. When Adam and Eve were put in the garden, what did God say would happen if they ate of that fruit? They would surely die. The fact that they still lived is nothing but common grace that God has extended to them because they deserved instant death. Think about that because so often we have such a poor, low view of sin. It's not that bad, it's really not that bad. At least I'm not like that person, or at least I'm not doing that thing. Sin is sin. All sin deserves death. The fact that God allows us to stay alive apart from him is nothing but common grace that any of us should be alive apart from Christ. Because in Lamentations 3.37, unless the Lord has commanded it, yes, Yes, this is in direct support that everything we do, God allows us to do it. Eat, sleep, drink, breathe, whatever. God allows us to do that according to his sovereign will. Because look at this. It is not from the mouth of the most high that both calamities and good go forth. Wait, don't we need to protect God from all the bad things that happen in the world? No. No. God commanded it. God allowed it. Is God all good? Yes, he is. So from our perspective, maybe we're skewed in our thinking, thinking that God is doing something evil when in fact it's good, but because we think that this is the way things are, therefore that is the fact of the matter. But scripture says it differently. And you've got to ask yourself, do you believe what this says or do you believe what you want it to say? Do you believe what other people are saying about this, pointing you away from this and pointing you deeper inside yourself? Or do you let the text speak for itself?
Why should any living person, last portion of the Lamentations, why should any living person or any man complain because of his sins? Because God allows them to live. And so we see that all of Scripture, both old and new, point to and affirm the sovereign work of God's foreknowledge and election. So look at verse 24. God didn't just stay dead as Jesus. Look at verse 24. But God raised him up, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in power. All right, I don't have much time here, but I've I've got to drive this home. That section there, I don't know what your translation says, but depending on what your translation says, some translation says, loose the pangs of death, reduce the pangs of death, or something like that. I like the LSB and the NASB because it says this. (laughs) Putting an end to the agony of death. Christ accomplished complete, fully, the entirety of the redemption. He conquered death and sin. He didn't loosen up because when, I love these translations. I'm not saying the translation you have is poor. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that when you give people a little bit of wiggle room, you give people an inch, they're gonna take a mile on this. And so when you see loose the pangs of death, I like to view it as someone who has their shoelaces tied so tight that their foot gets a headache. And loosing the pangs of death is I just unloosen the knot a little bit, but the knot's still there. What Christ did was not loosen death. He completely abolished that through his death, burial, and resurrection. And anyone who believes in him will also conquer the spiritual death. You will still die a physical death, but you will live a spiritual eternal life with him because of him. Not because of you, because of him. And when you look at this, it's so important to see because Peter moves him. He moves him saying, this is the Messiah. Yes, you did kill him. He did not stay dead. God used through the woman's seed, Eve, all the way to lead to Christ, and through the serpent seed, all the way through to the men who nailed him to the cross. Those two redemptive covenants here, we see the covenant of grace coming to the top. This is God. He allowed this to happen. He raised him from the dead, and then he brings it back to David. Look at verse 25 through 28. For David says of him, I saw the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not forsake my soul to Hades nor give your Holy One to see corruption. You will have made known to me the ways of your life. You will make full of gladness with your presence. See, what's interesting about this is you may be thinking, well, what in the world? How does this relate to Christ? What is David saying here? Love it. Peter answers this for us. So I don't have to exposit this. Peter exposes it for us. Look at verse 29. Men, brothers, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David. So Peter's saying, regarding what Peter wrote, or regarding what uh, David wrote here, what the psalmist said here, let me say this to you, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to his day. He's saying that David, this was not written about David. David wrote this, but this was not written about David. Because Why? David's dead and he's right here. This is where his tomb is. Okay, so he's establishing that this is a messianic fulfillment that David wrote. Knowingly or unknowingly, David wrote this about the Messiah. He's saying this, look at verse 30. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of the fruit of his body, boom, right there, you see that seed? Fruit of his body is referencing to the Davidic seed. Did Jesus come from the Davidic lineage? He did. He did. He did. See, that's the seed coming out again in this narrative here. That because of his seed, all the way from Eve, you can trace that to David, then David to Jesus. He was a prophet, knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of the fruit of his body on his throne. Verse 31, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. He being David, look ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ here in this psalm that he was neither forsaken to Hades, meaning he was not left dead. Jesus was not left dead. Nor did his flesh see corruption, meaning Jesus did not sin. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life. It did not see corruption. This Jesus, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. We've all seen this. Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. Paul tests to this. It wasn't that he did this in a far off corner. It was a public execution. Lots of people witnessed the crucifixion of Christ. More than 500 people witnessed the ascension. Not the ascension, but the resurrected body of Christ. He's saying this. 
God raised him up again. We're all witnesses. Verse 33. <clears throat> Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. You see that language again? That promise that we saw earlier in Acts chapter one, the promise that we see being fulfilled in the prophecy of Joel. And we see this, Peter's just connecting these dots. Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, which you both see and hear. So what the Jews sitting there listening to this sermon from Peter, having just witnessed this tongues of 15 different languages, having seen, understood now, oh my goodness, things are starting to make sense. Peter's saying, guys, guess what? Everything that you see promised then, you are now watching it right now. Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Jesus did live that perfect, sinless life. Jesus is of the seed of the Davidic lineage. This is in fact the Messiah. And when he's quoting back to this Psalm of David in Psalm 16, eight through 11, he is showing and referencing that even this is pointing to the resurrection of Christ. See, it's critical that we not only have the crucifixion, but the resurrection. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then we are supposed to be pitied. But Jesus did raise, was risen from the dead. He points out that Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father and that what everyone is seeing now is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Everything that's happening is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit pointing back to his introduction. So in this section, you see Peter's polemic against the Jews to say, no more. You cannot reject any more. You must repent. You must understand. And then we see later on, as we're gonna be getting to it in a couple weeks, 3,000 souls were added. So to answer that question of the title, was Jesus God or was Jesus a great teacher? Jesus is God. So if they ever come to this church and ask this question, and I call them up saying, hey, can you give me the survey details of that? And if we have any percentage of anybody saying here that Jesus was a great teacher but it was not God, I'm doing something wrong. Because if you don't walk out of here knowing that Jesus is God, that he wasn't just a great teacher, then what on earth are we doing here? Why are we even reading this? If I'm just reading about a good man, we're no different than any of the other major world religions. But that's not the case. Jesus is God. He's still alive, and guess what? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Boom, my drop, that's all we need. That's all we need is Christ. And Christ alone, my corner, uh, that's why the, the, Chad chose these gorgeous songs this morning, leading our hearts into worship so rich in theology and the doctrine of Christ because guess what? Every song we sung was not about us. It was about God, what he's done, what we can find and build our hope on. You don't wanna build your hope on yourself. How many times have you let yourself down? All the time. How many times has God let us down? Never, nor will he ever. He's always there. He's always present. He's always acting. Let's pray.